Dear, dear sister, I'm sorry about last night. I'm sorry for sounding so cold. You know how much I care about you. You're my half. Together, we're whole. But you were right. There is something wrong. Very wrong. For days, I've tried to find the courage to tell you. I couldn't, but now I must. Sister, I have cancer. I love you. I'm a high risk person. If you have the BRAC1 gene, you are at high risk. And even if you don't, sometimes you're at high risk. And, and so there are programs for people to understand and deal with that because they're decisions one has to make. Sometimes if someone's diagnosed with cancer, then the decision comes up, what now? Some women have to make the very painful choice to have prophylactic mastectomies. Um, that's something that I hope will go away over the next several years. That people don't have to make those kinds of decisions and have uh, you know, hysterectomies because uh, to prevent having ovarian cancer and breast cancer. That's, those are terrible decisions to have to make, but those are some of the realities today. The breast cancer incidence is going up uh, in Spain. We have not reached as yet the figures that occur in Northern Europe, for example, so we are not there. So we have less breast cancer incidence than than in the UK, for example, or in the Scandinavian countries. But the number of cases is going up. If women all had access to the early detection programs and to the new treatments that are available, we could get the, um, the death rate uh, up to about 90 percent. from The survival rate. The survival rate, yes, up to about 90 percent. Whereas today, in some countries, it's 70 and some 75 and others 80 percent. Is breast cancer still the number one killer for women in, uh, in Brazil? Or yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, the, the first causes of mortality in human for cancer is breast cancer. There are men, many women that uh, come to Inca in advanced stage of cancer. In very, very importantly, in the last 15 years, we have seen emerging the importance of cancer of the breast in the urban setting in India. So all the urban uh, uh, cities, starting from Mumbai, Amrabad, Delhi, Bangalore, very recently Chennai, uh, uh, breast cancer has switched tracks with cervical cancer to be the number one cancer. Is it a lifestyle change, you think, that is it part is, of the battle? It is absolutely a lifestyle change. No, there is definitely a greater incidence and more women being diagnosed. And I would say that a lot of that may be the result of these early detection and mammography screening programs. Because women are more aware that they should go early, naturally there will be more detection. Um, of breast cancer. But this is positive because it will be detected when it's extremely small, when it can be treated, and when there is the greatest possibility of a total cure. And lung cancer in Poland is absolutely dominating. In the People's Republic of China alone, there will be a million lung cancer deaths per year by 2025 if we don't intervene, another million deaths from tobacco-induced disease, and that's an epidemic of disease that the world has never seen before. At, at its peak in America, we had 160, 165,000 deaths in one year, and it brought our uh, healthcare system to its proverbial knees. What will it do to an emerging economy uh, like China with a million lung cancer deaths a year? We can keep that from happening, and we must. The problem is that, that tobacco smoke is harming uh, people which are working in these polluted places. We are worried about uh, air pollution. Because uh, the lung cancer is still our problem. Even you see, we have a really good anti-smoking uh, uh, campaign in our country, but the lung cancer is still uh, not decreasing. This may be from some kind of uh, air pollution. And you see the number of the uh, lung cancer in female also increasing every year. 
and we don't know what is the cause of this uh, female lung cancer, maybe some corrosion. Lung cancer mortality has reached a plateau among men. When you compare death from cancer, it's the second cause of death among women. Women in women population, uh, still in Poland, number one is breast cancer, however, very close to lung cancer. And we are thinking that to the end of this decade, unfortunately, uh, lung cancer will be replacing uh, breast cancer in the position number one. We're still in the growing period. Men is coming down, but women are still growing. Uh, we have brought down about 30% the incidence of uh, lung cancer in men, but women, they have duplicated since 1970 to 1990, which was our last uh, measuring. Is cervical cancer a problem in Albania? Absolutely, it's a problem. Absolutely, it's the second most common cancer after breast cancer in the uh, woman. Cervical cancer is the second cause of cancer in human in Brazil. With cervical cancer, there is a unique situation where we have both the way to prevent the, what we call prophylaxis, to avoid the contact and the infection by the virus, and then we have a second uh, fantastic opportunity, is to detect early lesions. So when combining what we call primary and secondary prevention, we are in the kind of ideal model, while you could consider if not eradicating, but at least controlling, reducing the incidence of this cancer. While the picture of cancer in Australia is still dominated by the big cancers of breast, colon, prostate, which really is a pattern throughout the developed world, uh, the fastest increasing cancer in New South Wales is in fact liver cancer. And that's driven, being driven largely by immigration from hepatitis B endemic countries. A lot of times we see liver cancer late. And uh, I think certainly screening of patients with hepatitis B carriers has made an impact in picking up liver cancer early. We have good surgical techniques, good surgeons who can resect liver cancer early. But once you get liver cancer in the advanced stages, uh, we are starting to look at drugs that target particular pathways in liver cancer. Uh, these drugs are all coming into the market. Uh, they're all being tested in clinical trials. Um, we're looking at chemotherapy in liver cancer, although it doesn't really work very well. Um, so I think in terms of um, treating liver cancer in the advanced stages, we're still a long way to go. So the main cancer in South East is uh, as far as the GI tract, it's the liver cancer. It's one of the most prevalent cancer. So the incident approximately around 660,000 new cases per year. However, the therapeutic that we have now are not very effective. So the incidence and the mortality rate are almost the same. This is such a beautiful sunny country, but the downside to all that sunny weather and the hole in the ozone layer means that next to Australia, South Africa has the highest rate of skin cancer in the world. And melanoma is the deadly form of that. We've got lots of um, the other uh, skin cancers as well, but they're not deemed as serious. Melanoma is quite deadly, and um, it's several hundred South Africans die every year from melanoma. That's a huge problem. Um, it's, uh, melanoma is an Australian disease. We, uh, we have the unfortunate conjunction of an Anglo-Celtic po population living in uh, the most UV intensive uh, environment in the world and a uh, tremendous fondness for sunbathing on the beach. Uh, so that produces a huge burden of melanoma, uh, a burden that continues to rise particularly in older people. What is encouraging about the melanoma story is that it appears that trends in melanoma are going down in younger birth cohorts. Uh, so people under the age of 40 uh, they're showing progressively a decline in incidence in, in melanoma and we believe that's due at least in part to the effectiveness of uh, sun protection campaigns that have been run in this country uh, through the cancer councils around the country for the last uh, 30 years. It also I think is very encouraging to realise that while of course the idea of a cure for cancer is on everyone's lips and we spend an enormous amount of money uh, 
there actually hasn't been a lot of progress in the treatment of melanoma over th those 30 years. The benefits we have seen have come from prevention campaigns. What catches people's attention about melanoma is that it is a disease that affects men and women equally. It affects a very broad sp spread of the population. Um, it is, um, it's the most common um, cancer in Australia in uh, people aged 15 to 40. And uh, so it has a huge impact on our society. What is childhood cancer as opposed to adult cancer? <laughs> childhood cancer is a disease that stops your life as an adult, it's, as a parent. Um, it's a disease that makes your life go from before cancer to after cancer in, in just a life-changing way. It changes your relationship with your husband, it changes your relationship with your children, with your neighbors, with your, your family, your community. Um, it's a disease that impacts, I guess, your life and that child's life absolutely forever if they do survive. What is it specifically? Um, kids with cancer get different cancers. They obviously don't get breast cancer, they don't get prostate cancer, they don't get lung cancer, they haven't smoked. They didn't do anything to, in their life to cause it. Children, they, they tolerate much better the treatment. They tolerate psychologically better the disease. Sometimes they are even helping their parents in the psychological battle. So um, don't, don't put too much pressure on your children. I saw the pediatric ward in Tanzania. I also saw the one in, um, in Rio, in Rio de Janeiro. And in both cases, the parents had gloomy faces and the children were having fun in the pediatric ward. The children were playing and all the parents had these long faces these hardened, saddened faces. So you're, you're, yeah. what you say is true. And, and, and this is even more so in the developing countries where results are, are, are not that good as they are here. And, and I guess any disease wants, you know, something to happen faster. You know, they want, you know, they want it tomorrow or they want it today. Um, but I think that children get forgotten. You know, the, even in terms of, you know, the, the adult focus on cancer is on screening and prevention. You can't screen and prevent childhood cancer. So right there, your huge initiatives around the world, global initiatives to reduce cancer worldwide doesn't impact our patient population. We can't screen for a childhood cancer. You know, you can't screen for a brain tumor in, in a, an infant. There was no way to screen for my daughter's acute myelogenous leukemia at seven, and in fact, not only are they not screening for it, they don't pick it up. Same with prevention. You know, what did a two-year-old do to cause a tumor wrapped around you know, their, their adrenal gland that wraps all the way up around their heart, that, you know, requires 10 hours of surgery and, you know, massive chemotherapy and three bone marrow transplants back to back to try to cure them? What did they do? Cancer among children is not preventable most of the time. Some of them are early detectable. Retinoblastoma is some of those. Is uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, cancer among children is one of those areas that need a lot of development, uh, especially in underdeveloped nations. Here in the U.S., we have some good things regarding uh, cancer among children. It's one of the most curable ones, and number two. Uh, up to 80% or 85% of children with cancer, they participate in clinical trials, which is extraordinary because they are getting good medications, good treatments, and the uh, goal and the uh, outcome of this is that they are getting cured. We have 13,000 new cases of childhood cancer diagnosed every year in the United States. Yeah. How does that compare with other debilitating diseases in the United States for children? whether it be muscular dystrophy or others? More. We have more. More kids die also from cancer in the U.S. than muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis, asthma um, combined. So you don't have a Jerry Lewis, basically? We don't have a Jerry Lewis. We need a Jerry Lewis. We need an advocate. We need someone who will be out there to tell 
tell the reality and dispel the myth that, you know, childhood cancer is cured. I mean, one of the things that people need to wake up to is that uh, cancer is the uh, greatest killer of young people apart from um, uh, accidental injury through road traffic accident, accidents. So it's really the most important thing for young people to be aware of. And at our hospital, we see nearly a thousand children, seven, eight, 700 to 1,000 children every year with, with uh, malignancies. And I understand that's a very, very large number of, uh, of patients in any one single hospital. Now, the big bulk of them, as you know, are the leukemias. Uh, they, they are the big, uh, big, large group, followed by uh, the solid tumors, the sarcomas, and then, of course, you have a proportion of brain tumors. If you look at the survival rates of teenagers compared to children and compared to adults, they're not doing as well. There's not so much research and there's not so much clinical trials. Um, both of which are critical to improving health. So in the last two years, we've been able to persuade the UK government and the UK health planners that actually these, these people need special, special attention. I quit my job um, and, I, I mean, caring for a, a child that was that sick and going through a bone marrow transplant or needing to go through a bone marrow transplant, um, I mean, I just, I couldn't work. Um, I was also pregnant with twins at the time, so it was, it was pretty crazy. I had um, a little boy that was one and a half, and I was five months pregnant with twins. I had a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old, and she was a seven-year-old, so... And it, hubby bailed. And hubby bailed. Wow, cool guy. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Is that what men do often? <laughs> uh, they leave the mother taking care of the child with childhood cancer? Is this uh, a phenomenon? Is this, uh, I'm not saying it's the majority, but you've heard of other cases? Yeah, I've only heard of one case where a mother bailed, but I've heard lots of cases where fathers bailed. Uh, I think, in fairness, um, dads or men grow up with this macho thing that they can always take care. They, they're, they're the caregivers in, in a different sense than a mom. They can fix things, you know, they can, they can, you know, make things better. And all of a sudden they lose that control. They have no control to fix it. And that has to be handed over to, you know, to God, to, to doctors, to whatever you believe is bigger than yourself. And that's a very hard thing, you know, to go from someone who you think, you know, you, you can't just put a Band-Aid on this one, you know, and put the kid back on the bike. Young people go through the most extraordinary time in their lives anyway in their teenage and young adult years. The amount of change that is thrown at them is huge um, and they are trying to become independent at a time when cancer hits and they become totally dependent. And actually what they go through psychologically um, is immense in any case in that time because for them, you know, for a teenage girl who, who, get, who gets a spot on her face it's a big thing. Well, you imagine what it's like for a teenage girl who's going to lose her hair, who's going to get maybe scar tissue from an operation. Those are big psychological effects. You know, when we've asked, teen we've surveyed teenage girls and said, what are you most frightened of in having cancer? They say, not dying. They say the fact that I'm never going to get a boyfriend. You know, these are the things that affect their daily lives, that actually nobody's going to love me anymore. And actually those are the things that I think people need to understand is just as important in the cancer journey as the cancer itself. And that professionals, if they come together in supporting young people in one environment, will learn how they can support young people to, do, to, uh, to get through those things and to manage that crisis much more effectively. My sweetie, we need to talk. This is so sudden. I need to know more. I'm going to look at flights and come over. I love you and I'm here for you. No, 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 you, you can't come now. You have too much going on. I, I'll call you. As a doctor, you learn a lot from your patients when they are informed. If the patient is better informed, it is better. Uh, of course, you find in internet also wrong information. You, it is. Sometimes uh, 
more difficult to discuss uh, with some patients who have misunderstood some of the information that they have read in the, in the internet. The danger also is that there is also information available there which is not correct. Internet is a good thing for information, but uh, without the explanation of a professional, like a surgeon, you cannot understand internet. Well-informed patient um, goes through the disease much uh, easier. You know, the internet seems attractive until you get in there and you punch in cancer. Uh, a new website and cancer every day, they say. Uh, you know, how on earth can, can, can you cope with that if you're a cancer patient, if you do not have the, the educational skills to, to tell one from t'other? Uh, cancer patients are bombarded with, uh, with uh, sales pitches for uh, unproven remedies, for quack cures, and, and it's, it's really quite confusing. So there is a need for a better, uh, better sourced, more reliable, simple format, multilingual information. One, I think one of the most important campaigns that we've been in, involved in is, uh, is our sun safety campaign. Um, and we're trying to get young people to understand about the damage that they can do to their skin. Uh, the Cancer Council has led a national campaign uh, to, uh, to, to have junk food advertising outlawed on television in children's viewing times. For instance, recently we just delivered about 25,000 postcards calling for reforms to junk food advertising uh, to the federal government. We are working hard, we have a radio show. Muy buenos días, amigos de Radio Libertad. Miércoles 8 de abril, miércoles 8 de abril. Y les estamos abriendo las puertas, las ventanas y el corazón de nuestro programa Preventorio Radial. Now I have the only daily two hour live health show in the United States on Spanish radio. Uh, every day from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. I'm on the radio nationwide, 14 states, 34 big markets. I'm reaching millions of people with messages that are uh, uh, geared towards one concept. You have to see your doctor before you get sick because cancer is silent. Don't let this condition surprise you. Okay, we have everything we need here to broadcast. For example, we have this is an ISDN digital machine. This is the way I communicate with the people in Los Angeles. You see, they gave me the name. Javier in California, 43 years. Ramon in San Marcos. A woman just asked me, she said, my cousin, she is only 26 years of age, and she had a cancer in the intestine. Cancer de intestino a woman of 26 years of age and she said would you please tell me what's going to happen with her and I said do you know the exact type of cancer that your cousin had in Mexico and she said no so that was an opportunity for me to explain to the whole audience that cancer can be only diagnosed with a pathology, pathology exam and number two there are over 200 types of cancer each one different from the different so She's going to call me with the exact name of the cancer next week. Estamos de regreso en esta suscita con el doctor. Muchísimas gracias por estar con nosotros. Soy el doctor Elmer Huerta. Estoy en Washington DC originando esta cita con el doctor para todas las emisoras afiliadas del grupo latino de radio a lo largo y ancho de los Estados Unidos. The most important uh, actions that we have uh, done in Brazil about cancer was the tobacco control campaign. We have uh, had uh, the results in, in this field. Uh, now, uh, the, the number of uh, people, uh, especially among the, the young people, has a decrease in the number of, of people that uh, smoke in, in our uh, population. Another example that um, we had uh, succeed to, to have campaigns with low costs was um, the measure, uh, by law, it was a measure in, uh, adopted in 2003 in order to avoid the, um, the broadcast of uh, Formula, Formula One races uh, in Brazil. 
we had uh, 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 the Minister of Health has the, the, the right to counter market a, a kind of uh, small piece of uh, campaign before and after when this race is sponsored by tobacco industry. And also we have health warnings every 15 minutes during the race. Uh, you were involved in an extraordinary campaign, I believe last fall. Mm -hmm. You committed an extraordinary amount of money to it, resources. And from my understanding, it was a campaign about access to health care in the broadest sense. Where did that come from? We did a very careful study over the course of a year. My board of directors asked me how we're doing on reaching our 2015 goals. And our 2015 goals include trying to reduce in America cancer death rates by 50%. And we've now had 15 years, year over year, downturn in cancer mortality. So I'm showing them the curves. And they, of course, look good because they went up every year of my life until 1991. And now they've gone down every year since then. But I said to my board of directors, however, we are not going to make our goal. So we came back to the board of directors and pointed out that we needed to redouble our research efforts, we needed to promote prevention into public policy everywhere, and we have to provide access to health care to all who need it. And the point of that is simply this, that of those three things, it's the most difficult and it's the only one that can keep us from ever reaching our 2015 goals. And so they showed support for me and for the organization to step out and help the American people begin to see the broken healthcare system through the cancer lens. And it's definitely moved the needle. People look at someone who's suffering from, these are real, these are not actors and actresses. These are real people who've called our call center and said, I've got cancer, I can't get the treatment I need, even, even, even though I have insurance. And so we documented that, and people have come up to me literally all over the country saying, I can see myself in that. You're doing the right thing. It's one thing for someone to say, somebody has something, but doesn't get the care they need. But if someone has cancer, and can't get the treatment that they need because they simply have inadequate insurance, everyone agrees that's fundamentally wrong. So you're right next to the patient's bedside when you do translational research. You're asking questions in a human being, and the human being is not a mouse, nor is it a monkey, and the biological systems are very different. And I think in order to do clinical studies and clinical research in the human beings, it's a lot faster to get the right answers when you're right there by the patient's bedside. When you put a drug into a monkey or a mouse, you can potentially cure cancers in these animals. But many, many trials have shown that when you cure cancer in a mouse, you don't do it in a human being. So by pushing early phase first in man studies at the National Cancer Center in Singapore, by pushing phase two trials and phase three trials, uh, particularly in Asian cancers, we perhaps can be a leader in asking some of these questions, especially in Asian cancers. Um, and, and that's what translational research is all about. And uh, a, a lot of us here are focused on early phase studies, uh, doing novel drug studies, uh, because you know drug development is a billion dollar industry. I mean, to take a drug from preclinical phase to a phase three trial is anything from $800 million to a billion dollars. And so if you're positioning yourself downstream, um, you can actually capture a lot more information and be right there where the patient advantage is taking place. But for me, there's nothing more exciting than working with very clever basic scientists and getting those ideas translated into new molecules or treatments or gene therapies or whatever that I can then use in the clinic to try and help improve cancer treatment. We have uh, uh, at least 49 to 50 clinical trials right now. You have to be courageous to go in a clinical trial. What very often people don't know is that usually you are better treated in a clinical trial than outside. But you know, it generates anxiety when the doctor tells you, I don't know really what is the best treatment for you. So in this clinical trial, a computer is going to decide for you. And so I have a lot of admiration for patients who enter clinical trials. Hi sis. Hi sweetie, so tell me everything. So here's the story. I have cancer of the cervix. The bad news is that I was stupid. I didn't listen to mum. Just before she died, she kept telling me to get pap smears and mammograms regularly and I kept putting them off. Last month, I finally did go in for a pap and a mammo and I found out that I had a normal growth in the cervix. 
Can't it be removed? It's small, right? How did it happen? How are you feeling? Easy, easy. One question at a time. Look, it just happened. Apparently, cancer of the cervix is the commonest cancer among women. It's mostly caused by a sexually transmitted infection called HPV. You mean HIV? No, no, HPV. It stands for human papilloma virus. Wait, it's sexually transmitted? I thought you used condoms. That's what you kept telling me. I do, but condoms don't stop HPV. It can be transmitted via pubic contact. The bad news is that the more sexual partners you have, the greater your chances of getting it. And considering how active we've both been... Excuse me? Come on, sis. It's me you're talking to, not mum. It is indeed a dream for the oncologist of the 21st century to be able to really prescribe the right drug for the right patient at the right moment, which is not something we are doing now. We know that. We select the treatment on the basis of average results obtained in large clinical trials. What we are going, hopefully, to do in the next few years is analyze the individual tumor of a patient, understand what makes this tumor growing, particularly for this patient, and then select the best agent for the patient. The, the business of, uh, of, of making intelligent uh, drugs to target a particular new genetic mutation, uh, that, that's, a, that's a new science. Uh, we reckon we can now um, go through somebody's entire uh, genome uh, pretty quickly. Uh, like uh, like ours rather than months. So, you know, looking for genetic mutations is now, you know, going to be, uh, you know, coming down to as quick as doing uh, a cancer screening test. So very exciting uh, changes in the lab, which is going to make the, the, the doctors in the clinic um, far more uh, informed about uh, which patient gets which, uh, which drug. We have identified in the cancer cells targets and designed intelligent drugs recognizing these targets and able to antagonize these targets. And right now we see an exponential growth in the discovery of these really intelligent compounds that work on their own or in, collab in combination with chemotherapy. And, um, and this is just fantastic. I think this uh, understanding of the disease, all the possibilities that we now have to make real progress, but again, if we get enough support financially and if we accept to work all together. The more you understand how drugs work, the more you can use them in combinations. And you know, empirically, for a long time we've used combination drugs, but they're based on combinations. The combinations are based on whether or not it works to shrink the tumor, mm -hmm. rather than how does it work to kill the cell based on our knowledge of the molecular pathways that are involved. And so when you start to understand exactly how the drugs are working, you can make your mixes much more precise. And along with that comes this whole idea of personalized medicine, that, that cancer, as you know, is not one disease. Cancer is thousands of diseases. And even you take something as what sounds like one disease, like breast cancer. And breast cancer can be broken down into five or six different categories. And within each one of those categories, each patient has a different molecular signature. And that molecular signature is going to determine how they respond. And so it gets really complicated really quickly. But if you understand, so for each individual disease, you have to tailor your therapy. Everywhere I went in the Northern Hemisphere, I was confronted with an incredible enthusiasm around targeting, around gene therapy, around taking every single tumor and treating every single tumor individually. Mm -hmm. Every time I went to the South, I was told, pipe dream. Mm -hmm. What's the future like in the next five to ten years when it comes to these technological wonders? Are we going to be creating a larger gap? Because you're telling me we want to close the gap with the South. And I have a feeling for now that with technology, once again, we're going to open it up. I think 
what you're hearing from the north is research and research priorities, and what you're hearing from the south is practical day-to-day -day treatment. Mm -hmm. In the north, if we want to call it that, in the north, 99.99% of patients are treated in conventional ways without these um, individualised cancer therapies. These are research issues at the present time. There's hope in them, but there's still research. It won't be universally available in five years. In the north, it won't be universally available in five years' time. It won't be universally available in ten years' time in the north. It'll expand gradually, but it won't take over as the predominant way to treat cancer patients in the north. It's the day-to-day, -day, it's the protocol-driven, it's the use of existing therapies and drugs, perhaps a few new drugs to help things along. These are the standard ways to treat cancer in the north and in the south for the foreseeable future. And what we're seeing in the north with all this work on <coughs> nanoparticles, microarrays with gene therapies, these are all very interesting, very promising research leads at the present time which need to come to fruition. But they will come to fruition. 30 years ago, 1972, Matty published a paper in Lancet which showed that BCG was capable of curing cancer and it was immunotherapy that was the way ahead and it was going to be solve all the problems within the next 10 years or so. It hasn't happened. Most patients do not know what radiotherapy is. Unfortunately, there is no Swahili, good Swahili word for radiotherapy. And when they are talking with their friends or even professionals, they talk in a Swahili way as if radiotherapy was going to ban them. So they say you are going to have a treatment that might, of course you do get skin reactions, you get what you'd call probably sunburn or whatever, but uh, calling a treatment like that does not help it very much, especially if somebody has fears about the treatment. And then uh, when they come, there are side effects that one gets with radiation in terms of the skin reaction, the mucosal reactions, the bowel reactions, things like that. And if somebody starts with a poor general condition, these reactions tend to be worse. If they're immunodeficient, like with HIV, the reactions are worse. So one has got to be very careful when administering radiotherapy in that population. Uh, and, and if one is not careful, the side effects of overdosage in radiotherapy are quite horrendous. And in talking to patients around the world, radiotherapy is something that is scary to them. How can you reassure the viewer that this is a good thing as opposed to a bad thing? Well, someone in Peru receives as much radiation, I suppose, that if they stay just in the sunshine. So we are in a, in a world that is full of radiation. You have the cosmic rays, you have the light ray that is now lighting me and you. So the rays, the radiation is there everywhere. Is the, the fact that we don't see it, of course, might scare us. And the fact that we hear about accidents that, of radiation that have happened because of the high dose, obviously they may create this image that that's the same thing. That's not. This is a well-calculated dose of radiation administered by a doctor, by somebody who has been trained, and based on calculations that are very precise and the physics of, uh, of the whole uh, radiation is calculated by medical physicists. So normally, under normal conditions, where trained personnel, doctors and technicians and nurses are applying the radiation is completely safe is, and is beneficial. And that's the best use of radiation you can ever find. If somebody goes to the seaside for their holidays, they actually may cause themselves more damage than going to the radiotherapy machine if they, to treat their tumor. The facts are that uh, more than 50%, uh, say 52% of people who are diagnosed with cancer should receive radiotherapy as a component of their care. In this state, it's uh, around 36% of people receive radiotherapy, and that statistic hasn't changed for over two decades. In the United States, radiotherapy is quite abundant in urban areas. We do have some difficulties in rural America, in southwestern U.S., in New Mexico, and Arizona, where people uh, can't find a radiation therapy machine uh, without traveling for 300 miles. That does become a problem. But in urban America, radiation therapy is abundant. And internationally? Internationally, radiation therapy can be a real problem. You know. Uh, 
where my office is in Atlanta within a 10 mile radius, there's probably 20 radiation therapy linear accelerators. There are probably 15 total linear accelerators in all of Africa. So certain parts of the world in Asia and Africa have tremendous difficulty in getting radiation therapy because the facilities just simply aren't available. When you look at the numbers, you may get surprised. Uh, the numbers I know in the developing countries altogether, they have as many machines as you have in the developed world. So if you look roughly, same number for about 80% of the population of the world and the other 20% has the similar number. If you look at Africa in particular, only about 20% of people have access to radiotherapy. And that's a sad story. This is very disproportionate. In this country that we have now, we are talking with each other in Europe, about 120,000 people have access to one machine. And in a typical African country, you would have between 20 to 30 million people have access to it. So it's amazing. I mean, just one country, I would tell you, I was there last week in Tanzania, helping with the opening of the first center, cancer center, and that's a country of nearly 40 million people and only two machines. So every 20 million people in Tanzania have access to one machine. We have nine linear accelerators in the National Cancer Center. You have nine linear, linear accelerators. accelerators? Yes. That's almost as much as all of Africa. Uh, that's true. Um, and notwithstanding that, we feel that our linear accelerators uh, heavily overused. The, the norms in the US is 30 treatments a day and our nine linear accelerators, we, we treat about 50 patients per day on that. For example, in India today, uh, a very rough thumb rule is that we have a thousand cancer patients per million and you need one megavoltage unit. So at the going rate of population today at this moment of time, we need actually a thousand units in our country. We have only about 350. And of the 350, easily 20% of them are the old first generation cobalt machines, which should have been commissioned a long time ago, and they haven't. So we are extremely uh, poorly serviced by not having enough radiation therapy equipments and departments in the country. But having said, having said that, the, the, good, the good news is that we have embarked on an indigenization program in India uh, with our cobalt machine program, the, the production of cobalt machines and low energy linear accelerators. And this has been with the great uh, support of the Department of Atomic Energy. They, uh, uh, the, the, the BARC has uh, uh, designed a, a cobalt machine which is called the Bhabatron 1. It was placed in my research center, which is ACTREC, for clinical evaluation. And on a, with a, uh, it was a wonderful arrangement between, with the, the people who designed it, the clinical people, that is us, who evaluated clinically, and the uh, industry partner. And today we have what is called the, the next model, which is Bhabatron 2, as an improvement. And in a very short period of time, this has only been there for the last three or four years, there are nearly about uh, 15 to 20 such units being installed in, the, in India. And, and the, the equipment is designed not only for India, but for an international market. So they're low-cost radiotherapy half units? Half the price. Half the price of the imported cobalt units. And that is the intent, that you have a machine which is uh, uh, equitable in design and in standards to the best at half the price. Uh, Japan is a leading country in the field of particle beam therapy, including protons and carbon ions. These provide highly focused, high energy irradiation and have been successfully used for the treatment of brain tumor and skull-based tumors and cancers of head and neck, lung, liver, and prostate, and also for other organs. And <clears throat> we have so far six centers for uh, particle uh, beam therapy in Japan, and additionally, four centers are under construction, and we'll start treatment in one to three years. But we have a diff also a difficulty 
it's a shortage of manpower in radiotherapy. We only have 700 uh, radiation on oncologists and 100 uh, medical physicists. Uh, in United States, they have 4,000 each of radiation oncologists and medical physicists. So we have a very small number of these professionals. So the government have a project to increase the number of these professionals. And this is a priority area in the basic plan for promotion of cancer control. If you're sitting here in Milan, there's no question that you're, uh, you're looking at uh, intraoperative radiotherapy in breast cancer. Umberto Veronese has pioneered the uh, uh, intelligent, humane treatment of women with breast cancer. He uh, uh, questioned uh, the need for mastectomy. He questioned uh, the need for uh, advanced, aggressive uh, uh, anti-cancer drugs. Uh, three, four, five, whatever cocktail takes your fancy to everybody. Uh, he has uh, championed the reduction of, uh, of not just chemotherapy but also uh, more intelligent chemotherapy. And he's now uh, challenging uh, six weeks of, uh, of post-operative radiotherapy every day up to the hospital if you can find a, can a space to park your car, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And uh, we're doing, we just finished the recruitment to a trial, 1,200 women with early breast cancer had a lumpectomy and either they had their radiotherapy in two minutes while they were asleep after the lumpectomy was out or else they came back to fought uh, with the traffic outside to find a car parking space every day for uh, six weeks. Uh, at considerable personal costs, considerable anxiety costs. And, uh, and we're hoping that, uh, that this simple little trick of intraoperative radiotherapy uh, will be equal. It doesn't need to be better because it's, you know, the same would be pretty good. Uh, and, and we can save the health services around the world a phenomenal amount of money. And we can offer also uh, uh, save a lot of angst uh, in, in, in the minds of these breast cancer patients. So sitting here, that's a really hot topic. And clearly we're looking at uh, uh, applying that in other kinds of cancers. How are we doing on radiotherapy in the science and technology side? Have we made very big strides in the past five, 10 years? Is radiotherapy evolving? Well, like most technologies, certainly, is is much more sophisticated, is much more reliable, much more effective. The pure science of it has not changed since Madame Curie applied the first cobalt source. So it's the same thing. Radiation can kill some of the cells uh, and and can also destroy some of the healthy cells. But now the machines are more precise, better calibrated. The dosimetry is much more precise, so obviously we are saving as many good cells as we can and only focusing on the, the bad cells, the cancer cells, and that's the important thing. Secondly, the machines are much more reliable, so they are really workhorses, the cobalt machines, especially for developing country conditions. And considering the fact that more than 70% of the patients come too late, what the radiation is doing is providing palliative care, basically reducing their pain. Morphine can do the same thing if it is well regulated, but while morphine is not available, radiation is the cheapest way that you can help those poor patients at least to have a decent death if they are gonna die. Unfortunately, they will die because they come too late. So that is the other aspect. And the third component that technologically has improved, these machines are very secure. So there have been some talks about terrorists taking the source, and those aspects are not possible. There is no way that the sources of radiotherapy could be stolen or taken out by people who are not involved in it, and it is quite secure. So that aspect is also very important that has made the machine safe and secure and reliable.